might have heard about uh, location-based services, uh, might have downloaded some location-based applications, <coughs> excuse me, to your uh, iPhone or your Android phone. And uh, these typically are services that take advantage of the fact that built into our uh, phones are uh, GPS um, receivers that allow the device to geolocate itself. And therefore, you can build applications that take advantage of knowing where you are um, along with your phone. Well, what I want to tell you about is not so much about that singular snapshot location where you happen to be, but really, if you will, about location over time. And so, as we heard about in the last talk, it's to some extent about data and squiggles and what we can do with all of that. And I want to talk to you about the benefits and challenges associated with capturing our location over time and processing that data in different ways and, uh, and sometimes sharing that data. Really, these are our everyday uh, traces and those recordings of our everyday traces, if you will, our, our trajectories as we go through the world, uh, are very, very telling because of all that can be inferred from them. And uh, telling traces, if you will, are, are enabled through, as I mentioned, the use of mobile phones and, very importantly, all the web and cloud services that sit on the other side of those phones because one of the important things about your phone, uh, most importantly, it tends to always be on when you're on, awake. Uh, your phone tends to be on and with you. It's with you as you go around through the world, always carried by you, so it's in the place that matters because it's the place where you are. And because of its connection back to the internet, there's a lot of context and a lot of information in that very powerful um, uh, uh, virtual world that the internet has created. And so it's the combination of this phone on you and all that data, the maps, uh, and uh, historical data and previous data that you've collected that make this, uh, these traces so uh, powerful. And We've been using this technology in a way that really emphasizes uh, engagement of the people carrying the phone. So more than trying to provide data to others, it's really about trying to provide uh, data to the individual and engaging them in relevant information about their environment and about themselves. So it's different from the fact that your mobile phone carrier, be it T-Mobile or AT&T or whomever, knows through your phone logs something about where you are and where you've been. Rather, this is about you having access uh, to where you are and where you've been. Now, I'm going to come back to this aspect of telling traces at the end of the talk, but I do want to mention it uh, uh, just to, uh, uh, to set that context, that a lot of our focus initially and continues to be on the powerful ways in which you can use your traces to tell you things about your life and your world, but there is this other side about how much your traces tell other people uh, about you and your actions. But let's start with uh, the constructive side of this uh, uh, in particular, and really why we've been building and exploring these applications that are based on telling traces. One of the first applications we built was called a personal environmental impact report. And this takes my location trace, my phone, uh, which I don't have here, so it doesn't interfere with the microphone, but uh, my phone has a little program on it, a downloaded app, that records my GPS uh, coordinates every 30 seconds or so. And that trace is then uploaded to a web server that computes based on that trace what I'm doing, because it can tell by speed and location whether I'm still, as in in this auditorium, whether I'm driving up for Agora Hills, from Agora Hills as I was earlier today, whether I'm on a highway, whether I'm on a side street, it knows the date and time, so it knows the level of traffic uh, around me. And therefore, it can infer uh, my exposure to particulate matter, for example. Uh, it also computes my personal carbon uh, footprint. It also computes my exposure to fast food establishments, particularly when I'm still and resident in a particular location. Uh, and so Peer was our first venture into really what is sort of an automated mashup on steroids, if you will. It takes my location trace and it personalizes information that's available uh, about my environment. Yes, I know what the smog level is instantaneously on any one day because I can look it up on the web or listen to a radio report. But when I compare my commuting patterns from one week to the next based on different decisions I make, uh, this gives me information um, integrated over the course of that week that lets me compare uh, my, my choices. 
So PEER was our first venture into an application that doesn't just make uh, traces available, for example, to infer traffic reports on highways. And there are some really neat uh, aggregation services that are starting to emerge. Uh, you might look up Waze, a really interesting uh, startup that makes use of contributed GPS traces to give you local information about the traffic um, incidents that are happening and the traffic congestion on the road right now where you are if other people are running that application. That's an interesting application that collects your traces and makes use of them for some community purpose. We were focused here on my using my trace to learn something about me and my environment. And so in that sense, it was interesting because it scales down. It doesn't require that we have 1% of the population in the city of LA running it in order to make some good use of it. And in fact, it was picked up last year by some kids in San Francisco across a bunch of high schools that were running a Go Green initiative to see which classroom as a whole could improve their transportation habits and go greener. So instead of just keeping diaries, they ran the peer application and uh, and they, and they authored a little Facebook application that didn't share their raw traces, but shared how they were doing from week to week and day to day as an aggregate class on overall reducing their use of, of private car uh, transportation. Well, <clears throat> this same type of data stream, when combined with powerful inference and visualization and actually additional uh, uh, human input, is really usable for a broad array of health and wellness applications uh, beyond that initial peer application that we uh, built a couple years ago. And if you forgive the pun, we really think of it as sort of health and wellness being the killer app for a lot of these uh, participatory sensing and location-based uh, uh, applications. And these days, this is often uh, referred to as mHealth or, or mobile health. Uh, making use and leveraging uh, mobile phones to support personalized uh, healthcare delivery and, uh, and research. And this, this context of health and wellness, I want to add to uh, this picture of uh, location traces that I've been talking about, another very powerful, pretty low tech, but very powerful thing that these, that these phones do. And that's what's um, been known in the literature for many, many years, long before mobile phones, long before a lot of this technology, been known as experience sampling, which is instead of asking you at the end of a week or a month or through a survey or when you go into your doctor's office, how have you been feeling? What have your symptoms been like uh, uh, based on this new dosage of medication you've been given? Instead of asking those retrospective questions, ask you in the moment, sampling your experience. What's your dizziness level right now? What did you eat at your last meal? And uh, smartphones are amazingly uh, adept at that sort of experience sampling because they can be programmed to at certain times or places and even in more intelligently adaptive ways to the, uh, to the person's behavior to come up and ask them those critical questions. They can record the answer and it all becomes part of an individual's, if you will, personal data stream that they in themselves, that they with a coach, that they with a uh, a, a caretaker that they with a clinician can analyze and use to personalize their particular care plan. So consider someone struggling with multiple chronic diseases, increasingly an issue in a lot of the Western world and increasingly the developing world as well. Someone who's diabetic and has hypertension, a very common uh, set of multiple conditions, very difficult to manage hypertension uh, in diabetics. Um, 60% of people on hypertension medication drop off that medication after six months because the side effects of the medication is more palpable than the disease itself. So how do you help somebody manage exactly when and at what dosage uh, they take that medication and make it work in the best way that it can for them? This is the flip side of personalized medicine. It's not just your genes that can help uh, medical science know better exactly how to treat you. The other side of how you are and how you respond is your environment, broadly construed, what you eat, what you breathe, what you do. Um, and so mobile phones, and in this context, help you capture and help you run that sort of uh, uh, feedback that you need in order to personalize and specialize um, that medication. So um, this same kind of approach can be used to help to tailor treatment for cardiovascular disease, uh, treatment of wounds following surgery, whole range of conditions. This isn't something you need to do 365 days a year. It's the notion that when you get some adjusted uh, care plan, you're given a prescription to do some detailed self-monitoring, and that data becomes uh, a part of what you and your clinician and your informal uh, caregivers uh, uh, can make use of to better treat 
um, your, uh, your malady. And one of the interesting things is to point out this doesn't always need a smartphone. And for a number of years yet, where we still have a large population that doesn't have a smartphone or a smartphone that's easily uh, programmed, a number of these things can be captured, as Twitter has shown us, in, from very simple SMS-based messaging. And uh, a student at SENS, and well-known on the, on the web and people interested in data, uh, Nathan Yao, has a very fascinating site called Your Flowing Data that I encourage you to look at that lets you choose what you want to self-monitor, do so through simple SMS SMSs and make use of some of the data visualization and analysis tools uh, that, he's, that he's created to enable people uh, to look at their, um, at their data. So now I want to come back to the flip side of that uh, double meaning to the notion of telling traces. Because the flip side of this is that these traces in the raw, if you will, these traces shared in their raw form are extremely telling and maybe too telling. Maybe you want your clinician to know to what extent your sleep has been disrupted and how much sleep you've been getting since that medication has been adjusted. But maybe that clinician doesn't need to know where you've been sleeping. <laughs> and so the notion is, is that these detailed traces, these detailed answers to questions, all of which is time-coded and geocoded, automatically analyzed, automatically uploaded, maybe in their raw form, they really should belong to you and me, the individual that's capturing them. And in that raw form, because in these raw form, these living traces are really pre-transactional. They're really even more private than your Amazon purchases and your Google searches and your Yahoo searches, right? Those don't strictly belong to you. That's a transaction with a third party, as is your walking to a lab and getting a blood test. There's a lot of regulation about keeping that data private, but there's record of that transaction for your safety and for payment and all sorts of things. But where you are every moment of the day and how you're feeling is pre-transactional. These things are as private as our thoughts in some respect. They quantify our habits, our routines, and um, they really are um, not subject to any regulation. Your bank, your mobile carrier is subject to regulation. Your doctor is subject to HIPAA about how secure they have to keep those records. When I uh, put up a, an app and you download it and you record your traces and you choose to put it up on the web, there's no one regulating that behavior. And we clearly, as a, uh, as a society, have been quite willing to give away huge amounts of data for a free coupon or a discount um, uh, and so forth. And so we're trying to suggest that there are some privacy practices that it would be good to promote. And as technologists and innovators, we're trying to put those uh, in place, maybe per not, perhaps not as the only way that these things roll out, but as a path to have these things roll out. And the concept is basically the notion of a personal data vault, that your data streams go into a, it doesn't have to be in your home, we don't keep our money in our mattress and we still consider it ours and secure. It goes into a secure encrypted container in the cloud, not mineable by anybody until we choose and in ways that we choose to share those uh, traces uh, over time. And many challenges associated with it. I don't know if you know, but your diary, for example, is not private. It is in the sense that it can be subpoenaed. There is no privilege associated with your diary. You can't declare, you know, Fifth Amendment that you don't want to incriminate yourself if you've written things down. That little fact makes it a little problematic to think about the legal basis for protecting our traces as well. But just as we've come back and looked at other legal precedent in the face of new technologies, this is now a time, both on the legal front and on the technological front, to start to look back and say, do we need new practices? Uh, do we need new uh, protection for our traces? Because they are simply extremely telling. And we're going to want to make use of that telling nature of them to manage our personal lives, our carbon footprints, our health and wellness. And we're going to want to protect them as well and do that in a safe context. Uh, so with that, I leave off and encourage you to look into some of the positive aspects of these uh, available technologies, as well as uh, protecting our privacy as we go along with it. Thank you. Thank you.